So we are thinking about, aren't we, grace as our teacher. So just to root ourselves in the text, let's turn to <coughs> Titus and uh, chapter 2. Now I know we're all familiar with these verses, but it's always right, I think, to ground ourselves in the text that we are dealing with. So you remember Titus 2, verses 11 through to 15. And we are particularly taking notice of verse 12. So let's read these mm -hmm. verses then. So this is Titus and uh, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, sell us for good work, works. Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. So we normally start, don't we, with verse uh, 15, and we say that here is Paul in prison, writing to this young minister, emphasising the ministry that he wants to see Titus um, develop. And so he wants Titus to teach and exhort and speak what we've just read, that the grace of God is our teacher, that there are those three subject areas, do you remember? There's how to say no to yourself, which we haven't looked at at all. Then there are the, 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 the grace of God teaching us in the here and now, teaching us how to live soberly, righteously and godly. That's the second subject area. And then the third, verse 13, uh, the grace of God teaches us to look forward, to look to the future, to look to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we've zoned in on the second area. We are looking at how grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now, I think before the summer, we sort of chased the word soberly around the New Testament, and we saw that it means to be sound-minded, to think correctly. And we've just begun to look at the second of these three terms, the word righteously. And the word righteously then focuses on relationships. And all that the Bible teaches us about relationships, grace will teach us how to conduct our relationships. That's what the word righteously is concerned with. And then perhaps in, in due course, we look at the word godly. And the word godly there is a way of referring to the principles that govern our relationship with God. So what can we learn, what can grace teach us about the foundations that govern our relationship to God? That's the word godly. So we'll come to that, but we're dealing with righteously at the moment. And let me kind of remind you what we've said so far. We've talked about um, parents and children. We've talked about burdens, bearing one another's burdens, bearing your own burden. And we've also talked about how we move from being self-interested to being interested with others. So we start off, Philippians 2, we all seek our own, but then we learn by grace to share and, and be concerned about the interests of others. That's what we've done so far. So what we're going to do tonight is think about the difference between sympathy and empathy. Okay, we were meant to do it last week, but we, uh, we didn't meet. So let's think about um, what empathy is, what sympathy is, and how they're different. And uh, before we do that, I've been reading again today about the Apostle Paul. And uh, we've talked about um, perhaps spending some of our Monday nights with Paul. Well, let me just ask you to think about the, the relationships that Paul has had 
and the difficulties that Paul has experienced in terms of his relationships. I was reading today about um, Paul and the breakdown in his relationship with Barnabas and how they went their separate ways. It was a very serious, very significant breach between Paul and Barnabas. And do you remember it was over John Mark? So Paul knew the bitterness of failed relationships. And then you can remember how uh, Paul stood up against Peter, uh, as we are told in Galatians 2. And that there again is a relationship that was very difficult for the Apostle Paul. So he had his fair share of difficulties within relationships. We all know about um, him and the church at Corinth and uh, the ongoing tensions there. But you can also see in the church at Thessalonica and the church at Philippi how Paul had good relationships. So all that he says in the New Testament comes from, I think, his own bitter experience. He was persecuted by the Jews, he was persecuted by the Gentiles, he was put on trial. So he had a great deal of difficulty in terms of his relationships. So I guess that's the background for a lot of what Paul tells us. So let's think about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And I want to start with sympathy, and uh, not with Paul, but with the writer to the Hebrews. And sympathy characterizes the relationship that Jesus has with us. In his role as high priest, we are told that Jesus is sympathetic. So let's turn to Hebrews 4, and uh, we'll read verses 14 through to 16. So this is the subject of sympathy, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, there's your definition of sympathy. If you turn to verse 15, sympathy is what you have with somebody else because you've shared the same experience as them. The Greek word pathos, where you get the... the uh, Pathy bit, P-A-T-H-Y. Pathos is to do with feeling. It's to do with shared experience. It's to do with connection. And then the sim bit is with. So what we've got in the word sympathy is with feeling. And you, it's a, it, the word with means to share or to have first-hand experience. So sympathy then is what you feel to another because you have felt it yourself. You have gone through it, you have known it, you have experienced it, you've tasted it in the same way as the other person has. So take a look at verse 15. God sent Jesus to be a sympathetic high priest. So that means that he was tested he was tried in every way that we are as human beings. And that's where his sympathy is found. So whatever experience you have, Jesus Christ came and tasted that for himself. He shared in it. He knew it. So whether you're talking about loneliness or betrayal or physical pain or friends uh, neglecting you, whatever it is, Jesus has known it himself. And so, having then returned to heaven uh, and being at the right hand of God, he remembers that. He keeps in mind his own first-hand experiences. And having uh, kept them in mind, he then prays for you 
because he too knows what it is like. So as you look at verse 15, he was tempted in all points like we are. And that's something that's not possible for any other human being. We may have some common experiences, but Jesus was tested in every way possible for a human being to be tested. So I remember years ago, I don't know if any of you would remember this chap. Um, when I was uh, first a Christian, there was a very popular author called uh, John White. And he was a Christian psychiatrist, as, as he called himself. And he wrote a book on this subject, and he talked about Jesus being tested in ways that are common to human experience. So that would be physical testing, um, intellectual testing, emotional testing. And I can remember particularly, he made the point that Jesus would have been tested sexually, like we would have been. So all the the, the um, range of sexual feelings and temptations would have been known by Jesus. So in every aspect of human experience, Jesus came and tasted it for himself. And that's then the fountain of his sympathy. It's where his praise flow from. It's the shape that his love has for us. It's from that first-hand experience. Now, that's sympathy. And many of you have wanted sympathy from others. Many of you have said, haven't you? Oh, well, unless you've gone through it yourself, you don't know what I'm experiencing. That's the search for sympathy, for people to have known what we know, to feel what we feel to have experienced what we have experienced. We search for that and we look for that. And unless we find it, we don't feel understood. We don't feel that a, a person has really appreciated what's happening to us. Now there are limits, aren't there? Uh, in terms of our human abilities to sympathize. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, there are no limits. So whatever we feel, and however we attest it, and whatever we experience, he has felt it himself. And so flowing from that then, he is our sympathetic high priest. And as you can see then in verse 16, we are then encouraged to go to him. To go to him in our times of need, knowing, confident, that he will be able to help us. Because that help he gives to us, comes from his own experience. That's what sympathy is. So what is empathy? Well, I want you to turn to Romans and uh, chapter 12. And we've got a section in Romans 12 that deals with the subject of empathy. So let's read the whole section. Uh, and there's one verse that stands out as the description of empathy. So let's turn to Romans 12, and uh, we'll read from verse 9 through to verse 21. So Romans 12 and uh, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honour, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, 
for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I wonder if you spotted the verse that deals with empathy. Let's just lay out this section then. So from verse 9 down to verse 14, you have a series of instructions to the individual Christian about their character. What sort of character should we have as Christians? Well, you can see it there, verse 9 down to verse 14. And then verse 15 down perhaps to verse 16 maybe, perhaps verse 17, you've got a description of relationships. So you move on from individual character to the nature of your relationships with Christians particularly. And then verses 18 to 21, you've got a, a, a set of instructions around uh, the Christian's attitude to those who are your enemies, uh, to those who are opposing you. So there are three sections to this little bit in Romans. And the verse that I want you to, to notice is verse 15. This is the verse that sums up the whole duty of empathy. So verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, I want to try and break down here what Paul means by empathy. And there are a number of uh, elements to empathy, okay? So verse 15 is our, is our, uh, our go-to verse. And uh, I want to break it down into three different bits. The first bit of empathy is the use of imagination. So you empathize with somebody by means of what you can imagine. Now, sympathy is what you feel. You feel sympathy because you've shared in that experience. You know it firsthand. So sympathy is about shared experience Empathy is, first of all, a matter of imagination. So when Paul says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, he's asking you to enter into the world of the other person. So if the other person is rejoicing, you enter into that world and you rejoice with them. If the other person is weeping, you might be feeling fine, but you enter into that world and you imagine the weeping that the person is doing. So empathy is, first of all, about imagination. Now, if, if you can be with me, what I want you to think about is this, and, and maybe we'll open up and discuss it. Empathy, then, involves imagining what the other person is describing to you. It's about visualizing it in your own mind. So just as if you were reading a book and you can visualize what the author is describing, empathy is the visualizing of what the other person is telling you. You begin to see it. You see what they're telling you. You visualize it. You, you allow the picture to form in your head so that you can then almost be in the scene with them. Can you see how it's an imaginary thing then? So it's very much this idea of entering into the world through imagination. Now that's the first stage of empathy. So I'm sure all of us have done that. Somebody's telling us something and you know, at a simple level, let's imagine they're describing a holiday and we begin to picture the room that they've stayed in, the resort that they've attended. We begin to picture the scene at the seaside and we begin to imagine what the seafront looks like. That's empathizing. It's, it's beginning to create in your own mind the picture that you are being told. Okay, so there's the first element to empathy. 
It's imagination. So rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. The second element of empathy is a refusal to judge. So when you rejoice with somebody, you're not thinking to yourself, well, they haven't got much to, to rejoice about. Oh, that's no big deal. You don't judge. Now, I want to emphasize this because some of you I've had conversations with about people, other people, and I've, and I've tried to talk to you about what somebody else is going through. And sometimes you've said to me, well, Neil, surely you can't approve of what somebody else is going through. Now, you see, empathy is the ability to imagine what somebody else is experiencing. And you're imagining it. And you can see it from their point of view. But that doesn't mean you agree with it. And simply imagining it doesn't mean you approve. But you can nonetheless see it clearly because you've entered into that world that you are being described. So I don't think I'm making this very clear because a good test of empathy is when you've entered into somebody else's world and you've seen it clearly, but your own feelings about it are put to one side. So you might be listening to somebody telling you about a terrible mistake they've made. And as you've listened to it, you've imagined them, you've imagined them in the scene, you've imagined what they've done, and you've understood it, you've seen it completely from their point of view, so that you can sort of describe it perfectly. But that doesn't mean you approve, but it means you understand. So empathy is about understanding. It's about being in the shoes of the other person, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you agree. Okay, that's empathy. So empathy is imagination. It's a it's a it's a, a, a loss of judgment. So you're not you're not judging them. You're not finding fault with them. You're not condemning them. You're not doing anything like that. And then the third element of empathy is what you've got here in this whole section and the third uh, element of empathy is is love so if that's too strong a word for you you can put concern um, you can put fellow um, believers in the same family you can put whatever term you like but the motivation paul uses is love so if you look at the first verse that we read in verse 9 of Romans 12, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, we're not going to talk about that verse. I just want to emphasize that love is your motivation. You want, you want to understand the other person because you're motivated for the well-being of that person. You're interested in their lives. You're interested in how they are. You're interested in their faith in Christ. You're interested in their, their spiritual life. So that interest motivates you to enter into the world of the other. Now, that's what empathy is, okay? So I think it'd be really useful to, to open this up and discuss it together. But I want to just again differentiate sympathy from empathy. And Empathy is the one that is laid at the door of the Christian. So not just here in Romans, but you can see it time and time again throughout the New Testament that our duty isn't to have the same experiences as others because we are not in control of our experiences. So some of you are bereaved, others are not. If you're not bereaved, how can you be of help to somebody who is? Well, you can help somebody who is bereaved when you are not by means of empathy. What you can't do if you are not bereaved is sympathize because you haven't gone through it yourself. Now, you may think that I'm, I'm making a kind of hard distinction between the two. But really, this brings us to the whole idea of love. Because do you remember, in the commandment to love one another, 
we are not commanded to have feelings for one another. We are commanded to action. Now, sympathy is in the realm of feeling. Empathy is in the realm of action. So you can choose to be empathic, if that's the right word. Sympathy is something you can't choose because either you have or you haven't. Either you know it yourself or you don't. Either the same thing has happened to you or it hasn't. So sympathy is something that's, that's outside of our control. God brings our experiences. And if God gives me an experience exactly like your experience, then we can sympathize. But if God doesn't bring the same experiences to me as he does to you, I'm of no use to you unless I can empathize with you. So empathy is a command and we are to do it. And we are to do it in the way described by the uh, Apostle Paul. So imagination, non-judgment, and then the motivation is the well-being um, of the other person. That's what you have then with empathy. Now, Paul doesn't ask you to have empathy with everyone. So if you come back to Romans 12, it seems very much that his concern is that we have empathy with fellow Christians. Are we to have empathy with those who are not Christians? Yes, we are. It's part of the command to love um, others to, to love in a general sense are we to have empathy with our enemies now there's your question guys are you commanded to have empathy with your enemies well as you look down the verses you tell me if you think of other verses you tell me are we meant to enter into the world to imagine what's driving an enemy are we to imagine what it has gone on for somebody to make them hate us or to be angry with us or to withstand us or to criticize us you know this may be um, a great uh, ask but what do you think so so this is empathy and i want to end um by saying this to you you may feel that this is a big thing you're being asked to do a great thing now to, to have empathy with someone. And you may not feel up to it. You may not feel you've got the patience or you've got the um, energy. You may feel too burdened to empathize with someone. So what, what's gonna encourage us to do it? And I think what encourages us to empathize with somebody else is the fact of Jesus, our high priest, who sympathizes with us. So if you feel that it's too much of a burden, too much of an ask, you're too much going on for yourself, you're too stressed, you're too down, you're too anxious, you're too fearful, you're too ill to, to show any empathy for anyone else, then Jesus was tested in exactly that same way. So to feel as burdened as you do, to feel as worn out as you do, to feel as under pressure as you do, to feel troubled like you do by other people then that's how jesus felt so jesus enters into whatever we feel and whatever's going on for us at that level of his own experience and so because he has experienced it he can give us grace and help in those times that we are in need so that we might then go on to empathize so there's sympathy and empathy. Let's open this up for discussion. But uh, if you can think back two weeks, we kind of, at the end two weeks ago, we kind of pointed in the direction where we're going. Um, so I mentioned two weeks ago, empathy and sympathy. Can I just ask you then to, to note where we're going to go next in terms of, of relationships? And uh, I want to go next... Uh, to a place where I've had a discussion with two of you already. So I'm not picking on you or anything, but it's kind of triggered my thoughts. I want to go next to think about what are our duties, our relationship duties, in terms of the unruly Christian. So if you've got enough patience left, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians and chapter 3. 
So 2 Thessalonians 3. So this is not for tonight now. This is just a, a signpost of, of the direction of travel. So 2 Thessalonians 3. And I want you to notice a section here from verse 6 through to verse 15. So this little section lives on its own. And um, I just want you to notice how this section is framed. So this is, this is where we'll be going. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. And then look at how it's framed. We go across then to verse 14. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed, yet do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. So that's the kind of direction we may be going into next time. So let's come back then to empathy and to sympathy. And uh, let's open it up for discussion. And uh, let's kind of share what our thoughts are about how easy we find it to empathise with others, how difficult we might find it. And the, the whole notion of the difference between empathy and sympathy. Okay, nobody has to talk but let's open it up for discussion.